Marin Arrow, the sick podcast, CF Montreal talk. CF Montreal made it official earlier this morning, just a couple of minutes past 9 a.m. They basically tweeted out what everyone knew already. They just made it official. They relieved head coach Hernan Losada of his duties. They also let go of his assistant. And they have told us that the uh, uh, the search is underway for their next head coach, an organization that has had many head coaches now. Their next head coach is going to be their 10th after going in MLS. And this is going to be head coach number three now for Olivier Renard. Thierry Henry was his first. Wilfred Nancy was his second. And not even one year on the job, something like 323 days or something like that. Hernan Losada, his third. So the search is underway. CF Montreal made official what pretty much everyone knew, unless you're the most naive person in the world or you just weren't paying attention. Hernan Losada is no longer the head coach of CF Montreal. Olivier Renard, who is um, the VP of the organization, of course, and in charge of the whole sporting department had a chance to meet with members of the media earlier this afternoon at around 1 p.m. It lasted, I don't know, just over 20 minutes or so. A lot of the questions were about the same, about the organization continuously firing and hiring coaches. There's some questions that weren't asked that probably should have been asked. But anyway, we're going to tackle everything we need to tackle about what went wrong, at what point did it go wrong, why did he fire Losada? Was that the right thing to do? Are there others who should look in the mirror? What's next for CF Montreal? And of all the names out there, who is the best equipped to be the next head coach of CF Montreal? Who better to have than two guys who bled for the jersey as players, as coaches, and Nick DeSantis' case, a couple of other titles as well, but former players, former coaches, John Limniatis and Nick DeSantis. Join me coming up right here on the Sick Podcast, CF Montreal Talk. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to the Sick Podcast. CF Montreal Talk. Here's the chance. Here's the chance. They've got the goal. Absolutely incredible. Cameron Porter. Delivers the goal to send Montreal Impact into the Conquer Cup Champions League semi final. The sickest CF Montreal podcast. It's gonna be sick. Sick, sick, sick. Gentlemen, so glad to see you both. Welcome to the sick podcast, CF Montreal Talk. Nick DeSantis, John Liniatis. Uh, I guess if anyone would know how Hernan Losada is feeling today, you gentlemen would know. You, you live there, right? Hey, Tony, how are you? Good, how are you, Nick? Good, thanks. John, nice to see you. We're all wearing glasses. No good. Yeah, we're getting old. That's it. <laughs> nice to see you. First you fire him, and then you tell him, nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, we've, seen, we've seen each other many times after that, trust me. I feel, I feel like... Uh, uh, you know, the guy who's trying to bring everyone together here. You know, let's let's bring bread together. All guys, listen, all kidding aside, if you can't laugh in life, really, uh, you're you're depriving yourself of a beautiful thing. It's nice to see you both. You both look in fine form as if you could play today. Mm -hmm. Yes, John, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Nick definitely looks like he can. But guys, look, uh, once again, you know what this is all about. You know what it feels like to be hired. And you know what it feels like to be fired, unfortunately. Hernan Losada was hired back on the 21st of December. We're not even one year. I think it's something like 323 days. He's relieved of his duties. It comes as no surprise to me. John, you first. Are you at all surprised? Uh, no, I'm not surprised. I, I, I'm not surprised if you would have stayed, but I'm certainly not surprised that he's not there anymore. Nick? Well, not surprised because of you know, stuff that went on after the season in regards to um, the different press conference. Well, the one press conference with different comments that were made, whether it was through players or Renard, um, you know, you kind of felt like, how can this guy be back after all this was said? Nick, I felt 
and I believe this strongly, but you would know better because you were a part of your end press conferences. And obviously I never have been in that role or in that capacity. I felt like they set the table that day. Um, it feels like players felt comfortable to talk. It feels like, you know, they had no problem saying what they said. Some were going to be back. Wanyama, Piet, Waterman. Uh, others won't be back. Seems like Kyoto is gone, of course. He's training with the team in Honduras. But it almost seemed to me that at that year-end press conference, the message that was out there, and probably they wanted to be out there, was Hernan Losada didn't do the job. And we'll be back at one point to talk about and make it official. But it seemed like they set the table that night. John, did you get that feeling? Yes, I did. I mean, it, it certainly when players uh, make comments that are a little bit more than maybe the ordinary comments that they will make after a season, sure, it, it gives you a hint that uh, something is going on. And I know we'll talk about this later, but, uh, you know, the responsibility falls on multiple people, not uh, just the coach for this. Nick? It all comes down to, again, objectives that were set before the season. You know, uh, the way it sounded at the end of the season was that they expected more from the team. So I don't know if the objective was you need to make the young players better or you need to really make the playoffs this year because we have good enough team to make the playoffs. If that was the case, then you can question that. For me, I thought that Losada kept them lingering around the playoff spot all season with a mediocre team, a very mediocre team. And, you know, if you look at the other side, the younger players, did they get better? A lot of them didn't play as much. Uh, you know, a guy like Bryce Duke that they brought in, to me, I still don't feel for the money they paid and what they gave up in terms of uh, Miller uh, going, to, uh, <clears throat> going to Miami. Uh, it's still a question mark. So, and then the other young player, I think it's the center back they brought in. I think they brought him in the J J July window. I don't Alvarez. know if enough time. Al Al Alvarez. Alvarez, yeah. Yeah. So that's another question mark as well. So again, we don't know exactly what the objectives were for, for the coach. But in the end, after that press conference, it was clear that, uh, you know, the chances of him staying were very, very slight. You know, John, sometimes uh, certain members of the media, are are uh, are told that they're negative uh but you know when they do their homework and they read a lot and they talk a lot and they ask questions a lot and they end up reading a piece in the athletic dated april 21st 2022 i want to take you back dc united had ben olsen as their coach for over 10 years he was a guy who was <clears throat> the players seemed to like players coach you don't last 10 years if you're not, right? And then after Ben Olsen was relieved of his duties, DC United brought in Hernan Losada. He lasted 15 months. I'm going to read to you parts of an article <clears throat> that uh, courtesy of The Athletic back on April 21st of 2022, okay? Here goes. The DC United players went from probably the most relaxed coach in the history of the league so one of the strictest, and it was brutal for some of them, said a team source. It was always going to get ugly after three or four losses in a row. He's talking about Losada here. Losada's honeymoon didn't last. His relationship with the club's front office grew complicated almost immediately. Within weeks of arriving, the Argentine was calling on DC United long one of MLS most frugal clubs and without a third designated player for the entirety of his tenure to spend more on players, on training staff, on nearly everything. Concerns about Losada's ability to communicate effectively with his players and with other United players were echoed by several other sources within and outside of the organization. Multiple sources said that Losada would often go days or weeks without speaking to some of his players. DC have long struggled with soft tissue injuries, something Losada also sought to address 
His mentality was simple. If players trained harder, worked harder in rehab and increased their overall fitness, injuries would become less frequent. Yet the Argentines' increased workloads seemed to worsen United's injury troubles. In 2021, the club lost more man matches to injury than any club in the last 15 years, often struggling to assemble a full game day roster of 20 players for games in the season's later stages. Players were often pushed beyond comfort, not only in training, but during rehab, according to sources. Eight months after this article. Eight. See if Montreal hires him. What happens? We hear from the players that after three losses in a row, it got ugly, unbearable. We hear that the honeymoon was over between Losada and Renard, especially after I believe it was a loss in Atlanta or Orlando late in the season. We hear Losada coming out telling members of the media about all the players that other teams have that and, and where they spend, obviously lamenting the fact that they don't spend. We have players get a hold of us members of the media saying that Losada doesn't care. You know, he doesn't want to communicate with the players. It's a one-way street. It's his way or the highway. And every time a player told Losada of their unhappiness of the way they were playing or maybe tried to suggest another way, they all paid the price, with the exception of Samuel Piet, because that would have been professional suicide for Losada. And the injuries that this team had from the, from the beginning of the season to the end of the season. So everything that happened in D.C. happened here. And, John, you said today... Losada shouldn't get all the blame, which he did. It begs the question, why did they hire this guy? Well, I think his hiring, when we all found out, came out of uh, it came out on left field. I think everybody was surprised to, to, to hear his name. And this criticism that you just mentioned uh, was put forward right from the beginning uh, when Losada was, uh, was hired. Uh, they talked to multiple times about the situation in D.C. United. But this is something that's clearly on Olivier Renard to have done his research, to have felt comfortable that despite these comments, he's the coach for them. I'll go back a little bit to what Nick, Nick said in the beginning. When, you, when you're about to hire a coach, you talk about styles of play, you talk about players being there, players coming in, players that might want to. So all of this stuff should have been somewhat clear right from the start. So there shouldn't be that much of a surprise what goes on into the season. Now, the other point I'll make on this, you know, you talked about he, had, he can't communicate with players. It is vital, especially for this generation of players, to communicate a lot with them. Uh, it's not like in the past that some players, you know, shut your mouth and play. Now, you really need to have conversations with players. You really need to get... Uh, to, to know them, you really get to have exchanges with them and discuss things on, on how they're going to play, how they're going to do things and involve them into uh, possible choices that the coach will make. Obviously, the coach is the one who makes the decisions and him being strict is not a problem for me, but it all depends the strictness of what he is and how he goes about it. So if communication was one of the issues that was brought up right from the beginning, I think it's a major red flag uh, for... Um, for uh, Olivier Renard to have discarded uh, to appoint him as the new uh, head coach of the team. So, but like I said, what, the reason I said before it's not all on him is at the end of the day, like Nick said, they are a very mediocre team. So, you know, uh, if players are not uh, are not good enough per se to finish fifth or sixth in the league, well, uh, coaches can only do uh, so much. But it was clear right from the beginning that it didn't start well. I heard rumors of, of um, they're not, they don't know how to play. Yeah, maybe that's excuses from, from people, but it, it was evident that right from the beginning, it didn't start well. And coming in with his reputation did not help the situation because obviously players know about some things that would go on because they might know players from DC United. So it was, it was, it was well known uh, to everybody that he had his issues in DC on top of not being successful in winning games uh, in the MLS. Nick, I know you said that if we take a look at the team that Losada had, the fact that they were a couple of points out of a playoff spot is, is more than reasonable. 
I know you said that. At the same time, after you hearing what I just read, an article out of The Athletic, how did they hire this guy eight months later? So this is my take on it. And again, it's, it's, it's an opinion of mine. But I, I think Losada, in the end, you know, how does he have that connection with, uh, with Renard? Is basically he played in Belgium. He coached in Belgium. He speaks French. So that's criteria as well that, you know, you need to have uh, in terms of, you know, coaching in Montreal. And I believe that, you know, when you have those conversations, whether it's Losada's agent reaching out to Renard and, and saying, hey, this guy's available. And now you start having conversations and interviews. It's only normal that what I take from this is when they sat down, it's Losada explaining what went wrong in D.C., meaning that they're not from the same culture. He coached in Europe. When you talk about workloads, we had a lot of European players here. And they couldn't believe at times how little they worked physically. Because in Europe, you know, especially in Italy, because of players that have come in, basically they say we go into work at 8 in the morning and we leave at 5 in the afternoon. Because there's work after practice and there's the physical aspect and taking care of your bodies and all that. So there's a different culture there. There's a North American culture and there's this European culture. And I think that these conversations were had where maybe Renard felt, you know what? We have more of a European culture here. I agree with you on a lot of these things. But the bottom line is, is again, is what was the objective bringing in Losada? Was it trying to help the younger players get better? Was it bettering the results? Those are question marks that, we're never going to be able to answer today. The only thing is, is again, is, is that I believe that with a mediocre team, he basically took them to the last day of, of, of making the playoffs. And, and, you know, when you look at the players that left and, and, you know, talking even about replacing those players, whether it's replacing Mihailovic, whether it's replacing Kone, whether it's replacing Alistair Johnston, whether it's replacing Miller, were you able to put players in those positions to say, you know what, our team is as good or will be as good as the last one two years ago? Nick, it's an interesting question, and we're going to get to it in just a couple of minutes. But if we could just backtrack a little bit. Uh, Samuel Piet back uh, in the game, third week of September, following a 4-1 loss in Atlanta. This is what he had to say, and I picked it up here. It was written in La Presse newspaper, J.F. Teotonio with the piece, um, nous avons été complètement détruits, tactiquement. J'ai eu l'impression, moi et d'autres joueurs, qu'on était un peu perdus sur le terrain, surtout défensivement. Qui doit presser où? Est-ce qu'on doit les presser? Est-ce qu'on doit rester un peu plus bas? Je pense que c'était plus ou moins clair en toute honnêteté. So, I'll translate before we get to the next one. Uh, we were... Um, destroyed, completely destroyed tactically. We had the feeling, me and some of the other players, that we felt lost on the field, especially defensively. Who has to press? Do we have to press? Do we have to stay with a lower block? Uh, and um, it, it wasn't very clear, to be honest. More. We went on to say, J'ai vraiment senti qu'Atlanta était beaucoup mieux préparé. I really felt Atlanta was much better prepared. Atlanta, eux aussi, ont eu un match mercredi. They also played on Wednesday. Est-ce qu'ils sont beaucoup mieux préparés à la base? Are they already just much better prepared to start with? Est-ce qu'ils ont été, est-ce qu'ils ont de meilleures bases que nous? Do they have more solid foundations than we do? Maybe. J'ai senti qu'on jouait avec un joueur en moins. I felt like we were playing with a man less. À un certain moment, j'avais presque envie de demander à l'arbitre de compter les joueurs d'Atlanta sur le terrain tellement j'avais l'impression qu'ils jouaient avec un ou deux joueurs de plus. At a certain moment, I almost felt like asking the referee if he could count the Atlanta players because I had the feeling that they were playing with one or two more players than we were. John, I mean, if you... Those are heavy words. I mean, yeah. are, I mean, I right there and then, like I knew it was over. It was over. And this, this is the captain speaking. And I would imagine if the captain is speaking, is, is speaking this way, he's got the pulse of the room, right? The players talk amongst themselves. Yeah, I, th I think right after those comments, they had to be addressed very quickly by Olivier Renard 
Losara and Piet. I mean, they, I can't believe, and I don't know if they did or, or not, but I can't believe they didn't have Can a meeting. Can I interrupt meeting. you? Can I interrupt yeah. you? They did. Uh, they, they actually, they, they met with members of the media individually. All right. Uh, yeah. Those questions were asked to them. Hey, your captain said this. And they, they basically tried to calm everyone down. And Piet came back and said, it was for that game. I'm not talking generally for the season. They basically tried to calm everyone down. But if you if you listen to what he said, I mean, it was very clear. Look, it, it, comments like this at one point or another are going to have an effect either immediately or in the short term because a coach loses his credibility big time uh, with comments like this. And he loses the strength or the power that he has or the, the control that he has within the group when a captain or any player comes out and says something like this. So for me, it, 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 it became clearly an issue uh, with his comments on what the status of, uh, of Losara is in the team after this comments were, the comments were made because they're pretty heavy. Uh, and again, it all depends how they dealt with it. Me, my only issue or another thing that I would like to, to say is that, you know, other than the team uh, winning or losing, unfortunately, uh, the, the performance of the team was not very good. Uh, and, I, and I hate to say this because I, I sympathize with the coaches, I sympathize with the players because they are doing the best. But there was moments that I watched games that I, I couldn't watch anymore because it's just the performance of the team was not good. It was unclear what they were doing to me. They didn't do it very well. Uh, uh, and even to me, it was unclear what they did. In reverse to that, I think Piet could be using a little bit of an excuse because at the end of the day, you're a professional player. Uh, you need to figure out your own things on the field as well as what's supposed to be absolutely clear on how you do things uh, from the coach. So that's why I go back and say, uh, you know, the, the blame is, is not always uh, one-sided. But if they yeah. were not clear on how they played, that's the basis. You have to be clear on what you're going to do. But then it's also up to the players to find uh, solutions to things that happen in the game and execute them as professional players. Nick, before I get to you, I want to show you two clips from Victor Wanyama at the end of the season at the post -Borden. Let's bring him up. Victor, uh, even before El Nan was hired to coach here, there were reports when he was in D.C. that he had some problems communicating with his players. Uh, would you say that was an issue here in general? Uh, you, you talked about your case in specific, but in general, from what you observed, would you say there was some communications problem between the coach and the players? Oh yeah, DC was like that. <laughs> yeah, for for me, with me, I think it was the same. You know, um, I think uh, I think it's the same problem. Then I think yeah, uh, it was like that, and communication wasn't clear. And you know, uh, I don't know. You know, and you maybe you maybe you have it. I don't know what what I can say about that, but I think the communication wasn't clear. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm here not because of him. I'm here because, you know, uh, I think I'm a good fit for, for, for the club. And also, um, the Montreal way, you know, they build the Montreal way, how we play. Uh, we had a big, a big success um, last two years. And uh, that's what we used to, uh, to know. And uh, uh, me and Rudy, so many times we had the meeting in the office about that, but also discussion between among us. Uh, but you know, then at, after that we don't have control of anything. We can't decide. You know, everybody decide. Uh, uh, the person who decides uh, the final, uh, the, the person who makes the final decision, uh, he made what he made, and uh, we didn't have any. We didn't have um, our opinions didn't matter. I'll put it out. Just last one, just to be clear, is there a way back for you here with Hernan as the head coach? As I said, you know, I have contract here with Chief Montreal and not with him. So um, I'll be back here, uh, I guess, and uh, we see what happens. So we see. All right, gentlemen, earlier in the season, I reported, as did our good friend Jeremy Filosa, and I'm thinking about him today. Jeremy, the invitation is still there for you to podcast with me going forward. So I hope you have a change of heart. We both reported 
that Wanyama at one point went to see Losada and said, look, I want to talk to you about the style of play. Last year, we played a style of play where we possessed the ball. We did less running. The ball did more running. If we had it, the opposition didn't. We were more in our positions. There was more balance. There was more shape. This year, there's a lot more running. There's a lot more north-south. There's a lot more long balls. There's a lot more skipping lines. We get caught a lot on counters. It requires a lot of running on our part. If we continue to play this way, we're going to be burnt down the stretch. We're going to have nothing left. Following that discussion, what we know is Victor Wanyama started one game in the last 11 games. Ironically, it's the game that Montreal played one of their best games. They were up one nothing versus Cincinnati. After 83 minutes, he came off and Cincinnati tied it. 10 of 11 were off the bench. Some of them, he didn't, he didn't get any minutes at all. You heard what Wanyama said. John talked about what Piet said. Nick, I have something for you. Piet and Wanyama looked a lot better in Wilfred Nancy's system because of maybe body composition, because of the way they were playing growing up, the, the, you know where they are at this stage of their career. And when John said the players have to take some responsibility too, the players, those two players in particular, they weren't looking very, very good in this style of play down the stretch. No, so <laughs> you can look at it many different ways. And, and you know, Wanyama I respect a lot because, you know, he's played at the very highest level. And, you know, what he's done here in the last few years and, you know, just on his body language and what I see from the outside, this is my opinion, is that he's a true professional. He's a team player. And, you know, he wants to do everything for the team to have success. Now, going back to the comment of the Montreal way, you know, I think it was... To a certain extent, the Wilfred way, and to a certain extent, again, we go back to Mihailovic, we go back to Kyoto, we go back to Camacho, we go back to Miller and Johnston, Kone, when you think about it. So, yeah, when you talk about the Montreal way, or we were always in possession, you have the quality to do that. Like this year, when you start thinking about how the team is going to stay in possession, who was going to keep you in possession? Did you have a forward of Kyoto's quality? Back to goal, strength, savvy? No. Did you have a playmaker like Mihailovic that was very comfortable on the ball and was always in spots where he can either go forward, go backwards, and pull the strings all over the place? No. Did you have a Camacho in the back that has the ability in a, in a back three to see little balls behind the first pressure, the first line of pressure, not really. So, you know, you can put a lot of things in question. And this is why it's it's hard to go back and say, well, the Montreal way. Now, there are two players as well with all their experience. And, of course, you can question why Wanyama didn't play. You know, I'm very surprised with Piet, the comments he made. Knowing Piet personally, I would never, ever think that he would come out with something like that. And again, it's it's just being on the outside, knowing him. Um, but, you know, when, when you're going through moments like that, there's always going to be negativity. And like John said, you know, it's, it's important that when things come out, how do you clean that up right away? Because it just weakens the coach's position. And I think the coach's position has been weakened from those moments onwards. John, it's not an easy job for Olivier Renard to be told, I'm going to give you a budget of about $7 million to spend. He spent nine, but two million of which was GAM money. So physically, it's $7 million that the owner is spending. There's teams in the league that are spending 12, 17, 22, 29. There's teams that are spending. Miami spending $20 million in salary alone on Messi, plus, 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 plus. And Toronto spent $15 million on Insigne, plus, 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 plus. But we know it didn't really work out over there. But there's, you know, there's, there's, there's teams that are spending seven, eight, nine, ten million million on transfer fees to go get players. So Renard is furthest from that, obviously. His hands are tied. He doesn't have a big budget. At the same time, it becomes even more important and more critical that for every dollar he spends, you have to dot your I's and cross your T's 
that you have you've done all the due diligence in the world because you can't get it wrong when you're not spending a lot when you spend 1.8 million on a dp he's on the bench for 10 of the last 11 when you're spending 600,000 on Matko Miljevic and then he's released when you're spending 600,000 on Ahmed Hamdi when you're spending $600,000 on Mason Toy when you're spending and the list goes on and on now this came from a fan earlier today if we can Ahmed Hamdi Chenonso O4 Mason Toy Matko Miljevic Born Johnson Joaquin Torres um Struna Emmanuel Masial but it's easy to blame the coach. It sounds like Sylvain Decker is saying the focus should be on Olivier Renard and not on Hernan Losada. John? Well, I think uh, Olivier Renard, uh, for you know, he's done good things with the club. But at the same time, like I said before, of course he takes he has to take responsibility and all that stuff. But again, uh, in many times, money and 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 success tends to go together because you are buying what what you pay for in a lot of cases. But there is a club, I think, uh, in the MLS who spent very little money and did very well or is in the playoffs, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember which club, but well, it does happen. But you do need money. You do need money in order to have a better team. It doesn't mean money will make you a champion or win, but you need to be able to have money to spend. Now, I think the philosophy, from what I heard Renard say many times, is that he, the, one of the philosophies is to bring young players or to have young players and sell them to the club. So if we talk about a guy like Duke, I think that was one of the reasons they brought him here is because he's a young player with a lot of potential that eventually they could sell. So is it a club that wants to get players and sell them and do the best that they can with what they have? Or is it a club that, yes, wants young players, but they also want to make the playoffs on a consistent basis? And that's very hard to do with young players and make the playoffs and do well in the playoffs because it's a hard combination uh, for you to have uh, for you to have success. But Olivier Renard, he knows the situation. If he's not happy that the fact that he's only given given seven million dollars to spend, well, it's up to him to go speak to Joy and convince him that more money is needed for the team uh, to be better. One thing that I that I uh, I noticed in Wanyam and I and you guys can correct me. He yeah. said he had many conversations with Joey. Did he say that at one point or another no. in the in the interview? Who did he say he had conversations with? A lot. Yeah, I, I didn't quite pick up the name. Yeah, that he, uh, because yeah, the reason I say that is because again, you ha you have to, you have to speak to the people that that directly can have effect on what's going on. And Wanyama, uh, under his status, I think he has a, a, a right to say his opinion. He's somebody that's played, he's an older player. Absolutely, he needs to say his opinion. But I think he also has to understand that he's not the coach of the team. But if Wanyama goes and talks to Losara and tells yeah. him of his things, Losara has to at least listen and certainly uh, reflect on what Wanyama tells him because he's somebody that's, that's, that's a good player and somebody that's been around and has experience. So he should have made him think of, of what he needed to do next. So Losada, I think, you know, in his press conference answered well the last time because, you know, he was smart about saying, listen, if you're going to ask the players that didn't play much this season, it's only normal that there's going to be negativity. If you go ask the players that played every minute, it's only normal that it's going to be positive. That's mm -hmm. part of life. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah and but it didn't exist with Piet. He wasn't very positive and he played quite a lot, so... Yeah. yeah, with the question, by the way, if I can, for murder, I think it was St. Louis that didn't spend a lot of money either. Yeah, uh, who made the who made, you know made the playoffs? Well, when you look at Tony, when you look at these teams, and you know, I watched the game last night, Philadelphia, New England. Yeah, you know, I asked myself right away: Is how does Philadelphia always have these very positive seasons with consistency? And this is why it goes back to that their style of play. And their style of play is to make the team game very chippy, very broken. They have a good defensive line. They have a good defensive midfielder. But there's no players that you say, you know what, this guy makes a difference. They got their 10-goal goal scorer in Ure. Gazdak, that's their number 10. That's not really, you know, when you talk about Carlos Hill, when you talk about Almada, 
you know, Zilla Ryan that was in the league. These are players that make differences. They're just a team that has an identity in terms of what's going to make them successful. So when you talk about, like John said, what's the objective with a young team? But then it's up to the coach as well to say, you know what? This is the strength of my team, and I need to go by this strength here, and this is the only way I can get results. And when you look at it in the end, this team, mediocre team, was in the playoffs till the last game of the season. So this is why my question is, what was the objective? If it was to be competitive and hang on to that playoff line, then he's done his job. You know, if it was to make the playoffs, then again, you know, he, the, the, the sporting director can say he hasn't done his job, but then he has to take it upon himself saying, well, did he have the players to really make the playoffs? And is that a playoff team? John, I, I know you have something coming up. I'll keep you for another five minutes. Is that good till around 3.15? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Yes, yes. I'm sorry about that, but I have something, yeah. Yeah, no, th okay. So why don't we do this? Let's get to Olivier Renard earlier today as to why he fired Hernan Losada. Sur le, sur une décision de joueur, c'est beaucoup plus large que ça. C'est le style de jeu qu'on voulait faire, qui n'a que j'ai pas assez vu. Pas le manque d'envie lors du dernier match à Columbus, mais je pense qu'on n'a pas tout donné parce que c'est sûr et certain que si on avait gagné, on ne devait pas faire attention aux autres résultats. Et euh, je n'ai pas eu cette impression-là, pas seulement que moi dans l'organisation. Je pense que mon président l'a expliqué aussi. Donc euh, voilà, c'est un ensemble de choses qui fait que, que pour le futur, on, on préfère regarder euh, ailleurs. It's not only because of what the players had to say, but it's the style of play. Uh, I didn't see enough of the style that I wanted to see. And the final game, like, I didn't see the urgency of going for it and he said you know what my president saw the exact same thing they've been interviewed on radio a couple of times olivier renard and gabriel gervais and they both said the same thing by the way that in terms of urgency in the final game uh they didn't see players when they had to throw in the ball hurry up to go get the ball to speed it up when the substitutions were happening they didn't see players in an urgency to get off the field it's it, you could tell that renard and gervais obviously had a talk and they shared that in common about what they didn't like. John, you're shaking your head. Yeah, I'm shaking my head because no matter what the coach is like, you're about to make the playoffs, guys. So I'm a player, and I want to make the playoffs because it's good for me, it's good for the team, it's good for the fans, it's good for everybody. And I'm not going to run. I need the coach to tell me to run. I need the coach to tell me to go get the ball. So I, I, I'm a little bit, you know, maybe uh, I'm being too critical, but I don't really understand that. Because what did the coach? The coach told them not to run? Did the coach tell them not to be intense? I don't understand. No matter what the situation with the team is, you're about to make the playoffs, run, and make sure that you can't run or you can't walk after the game because you gave uh, everything that you could on the game in the game, no matter what the circumstances were. So, John, what you're saying to me is that when you were a player, even if you didn't like your coach, you are playing for yourself, you're playing for your teammates, you are playing for the fans, and you are going to run as hard as you can to win that game, even if you don't like the guy who's coaching you. Yeah, well, look, I don't, I didn't run that much to begin with. That's besides the point. But yes, yes, I don't care who the coach is. I care about my team. I care about me playing well. I care about my career. I care about my teammates, and I care about the team winning. I don't care. Yes, if I don't like the coach, we're going to have a problem somewhere along the line. But for that specific game, and I'm about to make the playoffs, I don't care who the coach is. That makes no difference to me. I want to win the game for myself or for my team, and then I'll deal with the rest of the stuff uh, afterwards. If we're talking about just a particular game, because they mentioned the one game, right? It's To me, it's unexcusable, no matter what the situation is, for players not to have given all, no matter what the system is. Yes, it's, it could have been bad. They weren't clear. I get it. But for you not to be intense and for you not to run, as hard as you can at the minimum of running as hard as you can in a game that you're about to make the playoffs, I, I don't understand that because what players sometimes maybe miss, the further the team goes, the more money they will ask for the contracts in the future. So I don't understand how that's possible. So, listen, I, I'm going to go along John's lines because 
even if the club, and this is why, if you're going to talk about one game, the last game to get into the playoffs, even if you as a club, whether it's the president, whether it's the sporting director, as a club, right, no, you know what, we're not sure if these players are playing for the coach. As a club, you will be present all week to make sure that the environment, that the mindset, that the motivation, that the players feel the club is completely behind us. We have one game to show everyone that we will make the playoffs. That's what happens. And so to come back and say, well, the players didn't show any, then that's on everyone. That's not only on the coach, that's on everyone. Because knowing when I was there, when, when you feel something and you're responsible for something, it's not only the coach that reacts to those moments. It's the club, is the club president. Is, is the sporting director present? Is everyone around the club, you know, in a, in a good mood? In, in the, you need to feel the right energy all week to go into a game like that. So in the end, so then, you know, everybody's got to look at themselves and say, did we do everything for that game to be right, for the players to give everything and leave everything on the field? John Limniatis, who should be the next coach of CF Montreal? Uh, look, uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it's uh, Moro. I wouldn't be surprised at all. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's also Bobby Smignortis because one, uh, Moro, when he was here, we know his history with the club. Uh, and when he coached, the team did quite well, or at least did better than other years, or a little bit better than other years that they did. Uh, at the same time, uh, what else could uh, Bobby Smignortis do in the CPL? I mean, his standards are way too high now. And he needs maybe the opportunity to do so. This, so these two, I know, I mean, I'm pretty sure they're in the discussion of being the next uh, head coach. And of course, it could be somebody totally, uh, totally different. But I think these two are probably where I would lean more on or being the next uh, head coach of, uh, of Montreal. I, I think um, Bobby Simignotis um, and his four championships are well documented. And congratulations to him on uh, what has been a great career so far in CPL, uh, has a lot of things going for him. One is that his teams play a 3-4-1-2. Two, two, his teams play a ball possession brand of soccer. C, he obviously has experience uh, in Canada and also with CONCACAF. <laughs> D, he's won, he's a winner. Uh, and E, I think it doesn't hurt that he's represented by... Um, the agent who's on speed dial number one for Olivier Renard in Montreal. Well, yes, yeah, and, and with the club, and, and I think it, um, you know, I think they have. I think the biggest, I think the biggest motivator for somebody like uh, Bobby Smignoni is, from what I, what I think, is that he wants to prove himself. He really wants to prove that he's capable of being a coach in the MLS. So that's a big motivator uh, to think about. Of course, we're going to have probably Kit Saladopoulos with us. Uh, and then with Marinos, it's going to become a Greek community in the, in the city of Montreal at the end. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think both of them, more for his, for his own reasons, you'll be, I think it will be good for him to be back. And the same thing uh, with Bobby. So I'm pretty sure these guys are, are, are in the mix. And I would like to see one of, the, one of the two of them come, unless they bring somebody that, again, has experience, uh, knows the league, is, uh, is, you know, he's proven himself, no problem. But I think these two guys should be big time in the discussion of being the, the new, the, the next head coaches uh, of Montreal. John, I know you told me you had a very important meeting at 3.15 when I yeah. got here today, so we're a little bit over that, so I'll let you go to your meeting. Nick, don't go anywhere. We're going to keep you around for a bit. Thank you, John Lemniatis. Appreciate it very much. Nick, all right. On that note, uh, Olivier Renard was asked about Mauro Biello earlier today. This is what he had to say. Oui, je comprends. Je vois, je vois c'est où la question, mais c'est le même processus. Quelqu'un qui est sous contrat et qui travaille pour une organisation, on doit, on doit respecter. Donc, euh, que ce soit pour Moro Biello ou pour deux autres, ce n'est pas le, le fait de parler d'un nom bien précis. 
mais c'était ça la question. Mais euh, bien sûr, on fera les, les démarches, pas pour lui, mais pour tout le monde, si jamais ils sont sous, sous contrat. All right, uh, there you have it, Nick. Uh, not so sure you caught all of it, uh, but um, Olivier Renard saying, uh, yeah, you know, uh, Mauro Biello is uh, the head coach of Canada right now, the men's national team on an interim basis. And, uh, you know, if we uh, have to ask for permission and do what we have to do, we will. And, uh, and of course, uh, he is, there's a lot of names that are coming up with the fan base, Nick. The name that John Limniatis came out, Bobby Serignotis, is a name that's being thrown out there a lot. And of course, um, a lot of fans who grew up watching this team play, loving this team, loved him as a player. And you look back at his career as a coach, uh, I will say this, Mauro Biello's firing, in my opinion, was not justified the last time around. Whether you loved him as a coach or you didn't, I thought he got the most out of his team. Now, uh, <laughs> going to be difficult for you to answer this, I guess, uh, because he's your brother-in-law and we know that. But your thoughts on Mauro Biello's name coming up today? Yeah, listen, I, again, now, you know, I'm someone from the outside that has an opinion. You know, I've been on the inside uh, and I think, Again, the names that have come up, whether it's Bobby, whether it's Mauro, in my opinion, they're, they're, they're valid names for different reasons. You know, I think Mauro, in the end, checks all the boxes if you start thinking about language, if you start thinking about understanding the club, if you start thinking about attachment to the club, if you start thinking about MLS experience, if you start thinking about winning in big moments. You know, you got to think that when Mauro was there, the objective was to win a championship. It wasn't to be competitive. It wasn't to stay above the line. It was to win a championship. And he came 10 minutes away to going to an MLS final against Toronto when you're playing against the Altadors and Jovinkos and the Bradleys. So, you know, I think, you know, John said, you know, Bobby has something to prove. I really believe that Mauro has something to prove too, because I think like you said, you know, he really, really believes and a lot of people believe that he should be coaching an MLS. And, and, you know, this is now on, on, on me and, and me being on the outside, but I know that other teams have approached him in MLS. I know that for a fact, and this is where he's at. And I, I you know, like I said, Bobby's, a valid candidate. Why? Because he's done very, very well in a lower league. What's the club's objective? That's the first question is what profile of a coach are they looking for? You know, and then the second is, you know, language barrier. You know, again, Mauro, like to me, he checks all the boxes. Now you can say, well, he's been there, he's done that and whatnot. They can look at it in different ways. There's no right. There's no wrong. But the two names that you came up with, I think, are valid names. Now, you know, when you start thinking about Marco Donadels, Alessandro Nestas, when you start thinking about European coaches that have been here, we don't know what they're thinking on the inside. But the two names that you've brought up are valid <clears throat> candidates for, for the next position. If I didn't put you on the spot before, I would imagine I'm really putting you on the spot now. Montreal, especially CF Montreal, that's who I'm talking about, has been known as a cemetery for coaches. They entered the league in, what, 2012. Their next head coach they're going to hire is going to be their 10th. Do the math. It's almost like changing a coach every year. Coaches want stability. It's one thing to be able to prove yourself, but they want some stability, knowing what Munch CF Montreal's track record is in replacing coaches. Do you think that would interest Mauro? A coach is a coach, Tony. And, and, you know, understanding the realities, understanding the facts in the last 12 years, in the end, he's a coach. And I know that there's a lot of stuff inside of him saying, I know I can coach in the MLS. You know, what better than coaching in my own city again? I've gotten a lot more experience in terms of now at the international level. You know, he was under John Herdman and for sure he's learned a lot of different things because, you know, understanding Mauro, Mauro's a smart guy. 
And Mauro's a, a guy that's open to learning, open to different ideas. He takes the good, he takes the bad. And I just think that now he's got a bag of experience uh, underneath him. And, and for sure, he'll be a different coach as well. Again, this is my opinion. And, and in the end, I don't know what the club's thinking. But going back to the candidates, should he be one? Of course he should. John Herdman in Toronto, Mauro Biello in Montreal. Pretty cool, in a way. Yeah, that would be a great rivalry. Maybe that rivalry can start again. <clears throat> we lost that rivalry along the way. Eh? It was, if you think about what CF Montreal and Toronto FC used to be, the rivalry with the Berniers and the drug buzz and the Piattis and uh, and that rivalry was 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 pretty strong a couple of years ago. And obviously, it's not what it uh, not what it once was. All right, okay. Um, last one, and this is probably the toughest one I've asked you today. You've said on this podcast before that we can put the focus on Losada all we want. It probably isn't where it should be. Should Olivier Renard's job be in trouble? Listen, I'm not going to say if it's in trouble or not. I think that the decision he's made today. On Sorry the, for putting you on the spot, Nick. I know it's a no. It's one. it's not putting me on the spot. These are these are these are questions that should be <clears throat> that should be answered and should be asked because in the end, I just feel that Renard, by firing the coach now, has put himself in a more difficult position because now he needs to really get it right because it's only normal that the onus is going to get, go on him and going back to of course for me it's it's the players it's the horses that are on the field that are going to make the difference or not you know the coach can do stuff but you need the players to make the difference and this year they just didn't have the players and you questioned a lot on in terms of salaries that have been given out to players that i don't even know if they've ever touched the field or if if they've even played 10 games for the club. Nick DeSantis, former Montreal Impact player, former Montreal Impact coach, former Montreal Impact sporting director and head of, uh, what is it, business international relations or international business relations, I think. Thanks so much. Um, always blue and white in your heart and in your soul. I can feel it here at a distance from Villa Sal. I think you're in TMR. But I can still, I can still feel it, Nick. Um, once an impact, always an impact. Impact, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Have a Thank great you, day. Tony. There you have it. There you have it, Nick DeSantis. For all of you watching uh, on Instagram, thank you on Instagram on YouTube. Thank you very much. And once again, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's absolutely free. You are watching on Twitter as well. Subscribe to our Twitter handle at SickPod CFMTL. Uh, was it a couple of days ago? Uh, I was asked by someone via Twitter, Hey, is the sick podcast CF Montreal talk going to do any more podcasts for 2023? Because, of course, we've shut it down in 2024. We'll see. And I said, uh, Yeah, we'll do two more one when they fire the coach, and one when they hire the next coach. Well, a couple of days later, they fired the coach, and I'm expecting them to hire the coach before 2023 is over. Remember last time. They hired Hernan Losada on the 21st of December. It's usually something you want to get out of the way before the year is over because once January comes around, you're back in training camp. So I think it's safe to say that we'll speak again probably sooner rather than later. For John Limniatis, Nick DeSantis, Sammy Agnello, and Juliana and Master Control, I'm Marin Arrow. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast, CF Montreal Talk on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.